Black Hill State bounced back with a 34-24 win over New Mexico Highlands on Saturday. Uh, for Swarm Days, they improved to 4-2 and two overall and 3-1 and one in the RMAC. This week, the Yellow Jackets face a road test against number 14, Western Colorado. I'm Alex Dodd. This is the Black Hill State Football Show presented by the Rapid City Journal. For 20 to 30 minutes each week, we'll take you inside the program with head coach Josh Bresky. Coach, how's it going? It's going great. It's going great. We're midweek and uh, just preparing for Western with uh, with everything we have. It's going to be a heck of a test this week. Yeah, with the with the winter weather potentially uh, playing an element with travel, have you guys had to tweak some schedules or make some contingency plans for, for the weekend? Yeah. yeah, we did. And we were planning to leave uh, tomorrow anyways with this trip being so far. But we're just going to leave a few hours earlier than we had planned. Um, we're going to try to get as far – as Colorado Springs, stay the night in the Springs and then get up and make the trek over the mountains on Friday after practicing uh, at Palmer Ridge High School on Friday morning. Yeah, I was hoping we'd get a few more weeks of this great fall weather that we've been having. And maybe we still will. Maybe this is like false winter. But uh, I guess that's kind of life in the RMAC, making contingency plans for weather and having to dodge snowstorms. Doesn't matter what sport or what season. Seems like uh, part of the bill there. That's right. And I know our bus company keeps chains on the buses for the passes. And but the good thing is, is you know, we've made these trips a, a lot. We've made these trips a lot. And our bus drivers have made these trips a lot. Our team has. It's it's all familiar territory. And we could probably make that trip down to uh, down to uh, Denver with our eyes closed. So um, <laughs> it, it's a familiar trip. We make it a lot every season. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, this past weekend. Uh, first of all, you guys jumped out to a 21 nothing lead there early in the second quarter. How important was that just to have a strong start and take care of business early to set yourself up for success? Yeah, it was a strong start. Um, I think it really um, gave us a little bit of our confidence back, um, gave us a little bit of that spirit back that – that we may have lost in that previous week. And it wasn't just the offense. I mean, um, you saw our defense have an awesome goal line stand the very next play, uh, first and 10 from the one or from the two. Uh, we took a hitch 98 yards uh, to the house. We kick off, turn them over on the kickoff. Um, offense gets the ball back in positive territory and scores again. So we saw all three phases working together well in a very short period of time. And it ended up being the difference in the game. Another good sign uh, was your big boys in the trenches on both sides. Uh, mm -hmm. On offense, you kept the pocket clean, established the run, uh, and then your defense really was, you know, kind of living in the backfield. I know they got, you know, just the one sack late, but uh, put a lot of pressure on on Highlands to to scramble out and and make plays, uh, and really lived up to the bill. How good of a sign was that just to see your guys in the trenches step up? It was a really good sign, and you know. Um... Unfortunately, going into this Western week, we we lost Nate Clay, our starting left guard. Um, he's a senior. He's been a starter since the day I stepped on campus. Uh, he was a starter for the Jackets as a freshman the year before I got to campus. And um, yeah, he just suffered a, an injury at practice that was, um, you know, a, a little bit, you know, just it was just an accident thing on a Tuesday and we were without him. So we had Jason Aguilar stepped up to play left tackle for us. He got hurt early in the first quarter. Cam Ryman came in. Um, our right tackle had to come out, so Luke Snyder came in. So we saw a bunch of offensive linemen come in, and they just played hard. And that's that's the one thing I felt like we didn't do the week before as a team is we didn't play very hard. And you might be able to get away with that a little bit maybe as a receiver, right? You know, ball's not coming my way uh, on this play. You can get away with some stuff, but – well, the one area you just can't get away with it is in the trenches as an offense and defense alignment. If you're not playing hard, if you're not exerting, you know, all of your effort on every single play, you're you're going to get exposed. Um, you're going to you're going to give up yards. You're going to give up, you know, TFLs and those things. So I got with the offensive line right before the game, and they typically like to run their own little huddle right before the game and kind of, um, you know, give themselves their last little words. And I stepped in there and I had my own little words for them and uh, encouraged them, um, challenged them. And, uh, you know, they, they answered that challenge. And, you know, I, I'm just really proud of that group. And I definitely wanted to, to let the team know that that was the difference in the game. And then, you know, watching the game, shoot, on defense, Kellen Collier and Zane Hood were just – they were just tremendous in the backfield, um, yeah. you know, 
Highlands did outrush us, but you know they had they had some larger rushes towards the end of the game, a 31 yarder, a 27 and a 21. Um, but it looks like you know we had right around 17 rushes of theirs that we held them to one yard or less. And so, you know, overall between the tackles, felt like we did a really good job. Uh, maybe that option got out on us a few times, but just overall the effort was so much better and noticeable. Where are you guys kind of at from a, a health standpoint on the offensive line going into this week and and really a, a really big stretch for you guys in conference play over the next two weeks? Yeah, it's a huge stretch. And we, we know that our goals are still intact and uh, it's going to take every single one of us on the team uh, to reach those goals. We're still without Nate Clay going into this game and uh, Ohio's or sorry, um, Western's aware of that per our two deep and all that. But other than that, we're pretty healthy everywhere else. You know, a couple of uh, nicks and bruises and things like that here, an elbow there, a knee there. But um, Nate's the only one on the offensive line who's going to be out for at least uh, one more week. And we're uh, we're optimistic that we're going to have him back for the Mines game. So um, really good there. And then defensive line, you know, we're, we're without Nick Arnold for the rest of the season. But uh, that's been – that's been three weeks already now that we've been without Nick, and those guys have really stepped up, um, especially Zane Hood making a position change. Uh, Malik Ritchie stepping up into the starting group and doing some really good things. Matt LaFasso uh, getting some reps in Malik's place now at defensive end. Um, Eric Eads coming up with that sack last week, and, you know, we – it was awesome to see, but they're still a little bit like, all right, that was only like our second or third sack of the season. We got to get some more now. But um, now it's – we're pretty healthy. We're pretty healthy right now. What do you think has been kind of the, the, the issue with not being able to get to the quarterback as much this year? Is it it's schematics? Is it just, you know, quarterbacks are getting rid of the ball faster when you have opportunities to come up with sacks? How do you guys kind of diagnose that as a staff? Um, you know, we are without one uh, dynamic playmaker that we had last year who transferred out, and everyone remembers um, Keenan Eck, number 41 from last year. Um, we decided to, in week one, go ahead and, like, we threw him on the bus at the last minute. Like, ah, he keeps getting to the quarterback in practice. And, um, you know, what he allowed Cooper to do in our Delta package was to clean up a lot of the sacks that he wasn't getting. And so I know, um, you know, Cooper, I think, finished last year with maybe eight and a half. If, if I'm remembering correct. And a lot of those were, you know, quarterbacks stepping up into into Cooper's, um, you know, bull rush and Keenan coming off the opposite edge. And, you know, it's he's a great player. Uh, we've moved on from that and we feel like we've filled that role. But, yeah, we're just not necessarily getting the production. And, you know, a lot of the quarterbacks we've played, you know, credit to the Highlands guy, did a great job. Of stepping up in the pocket, Johansson, uh, very, very good within the pocket and fleet of foot. <laughs> Obviously, the Mesa quarterback is probably the slipperiest of all the ones we've seen. Yeah. Uh, and the SBU guy was tremendous uh, with his Elway spin, and and he wouldn't step up in the pocket. He would deep spin, drop step, and get out of there. And uh, we missed, oh, gosh, four or five sacks in that game. So, you know, I, I don't want us to think that um, – I think coaches sometimes can talk – teams or talk players into having an issue you know a kid fumbles the ball twice if you go and talk to that kid about it over and over he's going to start to think he has a fumbling problem and what i don't want to do is get our team talked into uh, we have a pressure problem where we can't get pressure um i just think it's it's a combination of of a lot of things and we just haven't gotten the pressure we wanted but um it's not for a lack of effort by any means or or lack of design or we don't have the personnel it just hasn't happened on the offensive side what do you think it kind of says about Tanner Clarkson's maturity that he was able to bounce back and play with confidence, particularly in the run game? Uh, Cause you know, he had a critical play against mines in the run game, uh, but he wasn't scared to use his feet uh, against Highlands to, to put you guys in position to win the game. What do you think that kind of says about his maturity? Yeah, I think it just confirms his maturity. Um, nobody in, in this camp over here was questioning his maturity, his dedication, his care, any of those type of things. Um, you know, he, he just had he had a mediocre game, you know, versus Tech. And uh, we, I don't think, did a great job protecting him. You know, when you get sacked four times and with multiple hurries and hits, uh, that wears on a guy. Um, and so I feel like we did a better job stepping up this last week and giving Tanner time to work through his reads. And, you know, he had a lot more production. And 
Um, still, though, you know, we, we got to continue to push the envelope. I know Tanner and, and our receivers will, will be the first to tell you, like, ah, we had a lot of drops. You know, we, we dropped, you know, five or six balls last week. That really probably could have blown that score maybe a little bit more out of proportion in our favor. But, um, you know, I've, I've, I really love having an older guy like Tanner who's been through it. Um, it gives me a lot of comfort. And, you know, the guy just practices hard. He, he prepares hard. And uh, a lot of guys see that and they just follow suit. So he's been a perfect addition to this team. Um, he's been really, really good for the Jackets. You already talked about TJ a little bit and the career game that he had on Saturday, 149 yards on five catches and the, the big 98-yard score, the second time he's had a long one like that uh, in his short career up in Spearfish. Uh, how much does it help you guys from a preparation standpoint uh, to have multiple guys who can have breakout games at wide receiver and, and multiple uh, dynamic weapons uh, on offense? Yeah, it helps us a lot. You know, we're able to spread the field. And, you know, I don't know that there's necessarily anyone in this conference that um, gets doubled. Um, maybe Max McLeod a little bit. I think he's probably the best receiver in the league right now, in, in our league. Um, I believe stats would, would would support that as well. But um, TJ's just so great with the ball in his hand. You know, he had two hitches that he caught. Um, you know, those are two seven-yard catches that one went for 98. I think the other one went for 27. And he's just doing a tremendous job with the ball in his hands. I've been really, really happy. You know, the thing that impressed me the most is um, I think it was with the Pioneer. Um, forgive me for mentioning the Pioneer on the, on the general <laughs> show here. but And it might have been with you, Alex, but um, he got interviewed about the game and about his performance and uh, one of the things that stuck out to me the most was him passing on the credit to Tanner. Uh, that I thought was tremendous. I thought that was awesome to hear. Um, you know, he said, you know, Tanner's the reason why I'm getting these catches. Tanner's the reason it all starts with Tanner, 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 Tanner. And that's to me, um, that's what our culture is here. It's, it's, we, it's we over me. It's putting others ahead of yourself. And um, you got, Trust me when I say this, I didn't coach TJ to say that in the interview, but we have coached our players to put each other ahead of themselves. And, um, boy, that was, that was a really proud moment for me as a coach. Not what he did in the game, but what he did after the game and how he, he passed on the credit to his teammates. Yeah, that kind of stood out to me from talking to him on Saturday as well. Uh, how have you kind of seen that offensive unit gel together this year? It just seems like there's even more of an emphasis on that we over me on that unit this year compared to even last season. Uh, but also, you know, offensive skill guys, wide receivers, uh, it's a, a big temptation for them to, to look at themselves in the mirror. But it seems like you have a group that really likes to rely on each other and, and give credit where credit's due. Certainly. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, this this isn't a game – this isn't a game where, where you can, um, you know, just point back and say, you know, I did this and – you know, I did that. And I, this game is so cool because your success relies upon other people doing their job well. And that's what I've always loved about this game, especially as an offensive lineman. That's a that's a clear cut example. Like, you know, nobody's going to catch the ball if we're not giving our quarterback time. You know, um, nobody's going to be able to rush for 100 yards if we're not creating holes. Um, you know, it's it's a selfless game. And, uh, you know, I think our guys are playing it the right way. And I'm, I'm very proud to be to be the coach of a team that cares and loves for one another. And um, I think those are the things that, those are the things that uh, that'll carry beyond the football field. But I also believe those are the things that contribute to winning. And, you know, I, I love the the quote from the title of Bill Walsh's book, the score takes care of itself. I'm a true believer that the score always takes care of itself. If you just do, do the little things right and you care about the right things and you're extremely intentional about your game, but uh, it hasn't always been that way here, Alex. It hasn't always been that way. When we first took over here, it was an absolute mess. It was, you know, get all I can, can all I get, and sit on my can every single day with all these guys. And uh, we saw a lot of turnover in our first couple semesters. And um, But, you know, all these guys that we're recruiting, they're hearing our recruiting pitch. They hear what we're about. And those that choose to be a part of it, um, they get to live that out on a daily basis here at Black Hill State. So, um those are the things, you know, and, and I'm glad you caught that too. Those are the things that make me the most proud, not necessarily winning football games, but, uh, you know, doing it the right way. You guys have a, another big game this weekend as you start a, a difficult stretch here in conference play uh, at number 14, Western Colorado, 1 p.m. on Saturday in Gunnison. 
you know, how important is it just for you guys to, to capitalize during this stretch uh, for the things that you have on your board uh, for goals that you want to accomplish over the course of the year? Yeah, it's extremely important. It's um, it's as important as any other game. Um, but now that we're kind of getting into the stretch, the home stretch of the season, we're, we're running out of games. We're running out of opportunities. And that's the one thing that we have to make sure that we uh, that we're urgent. We're urgent about the season. We understand that these games, the guaranteed games are dwindling. Um, we have an opportunity to do something that hasn't been done in a long time, and that's to go out and beat Western this week. It's not going to be an easy task. They're a very well-coached football team. They have a ton of talent. Um, you know, I'm familiar with their coaching staff. Uh, I've worked with their OC before. He's a great friend. Jazz Baines has become a great friend. Todd Auer, um, you know, came from the school where I GA'd, and he runs a tremendous defense. Um, I think it's probably the best special teams group in the conference right now. Um, I would assume that Colorado Mines is up there too. Just haven't seen much of their special teams on film quite yet, but very, very well coached in their special teams. And so, here, here's here's the what here's the key to victory for us is we have to, we have to eliminate our mistakes and when Western makes a mistake if they make a mistake we have to capitalize on it and the one thing I've noticed with them um, is they are very very good at capitalizing off of your mistakes uh, much like a Colorado Mines team um, especially of late um, Western will capitalize off your mistakes if you throw a bad pass behind a receiver and it gets tipped in the air, it's going to get caught by a Mountaineer. Um, they're very opportunistic on defense and, and I believe on offense as well. Um, but at least on offense, they stay patient. And they're going to kind of grind you out. You know, they, they stay balanced in their attack and Joe McClain does a good job calling that offense. Um, but they stay patient and they will grind you out on the ground. Um, so it's definitely going to be a slugfest. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get into mentally starting to guess what that score is going to look like or what the, the point total is going to look like. Um, but I'm thinking it, it might be one that you'll like, Alex, one of those slugfests. <laughs> well, this is a, a very opportunistic group uh, that you're playing this weekend. They forced 17 turnovers on the year. They're plus 11 in turnover margin. Uh, how important is it for you guys just to take care of the football? I know it's, it's you know, probably overset and – in football these days, uh, but can't be stated enough how important it is to take care of the ball in games like this. Yeah, we, we don't need to help them at all, right? And that's <laughs> they're good enough where they don't need our help. Um, and it's going to come down to possessions. You know, we have to cherish and, and have urgency with our with our offensive possessions. Um, we have to be great on third down on defense. You know, I've watched a lot of games and um, they're great on third down. Uh, you know, we've already seen probably one of the best offenses on third down already in South Dakota Mines. But they're really good on third down as well. And so um, we have to take advantage of those opportunities. And if they want to grind their way down the field, then you know we'll, we'll grind our way down the field with them. And eventually we're going to find a way to get them stopped. And that's that's more about who our defense is, you know, is, is try to keep everything in front of us and play physical um, in the trenches and tackle, 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 tackle. And you might make, you know, three, four yards here and there, but eventually – we're going to get you to a third down um, that's going to be too much to overcome. Um, and that's where we need to make our money. You know, we get a chance to get a punt from them. Um, we filled that sucker clean and we get an offense possession. We have to go down the field and at least at, at the very least flip the field on them. If not, you know, get down there and get an opportunity to score. So, um, but, you know, I look at our matchup with these guys last year. <laughs> that was a tough one to lose. Uh, we jumped up 21 nothing and allowed them to climb back into the game um, in the in the last three quarters of the game and, and let it slip away. And so our guys know that they can play with them. Um, you know, it's it's just going to be a matter of, like I said, eliminating eliminating our mistakes and capitalizing on theirs when they make them. How do you count for Drew Nash in the passing game, their quarterback? 57% completion percentage, 1,300 yards, 10 TDs, three picks, uh, having a great year for them and, and really setting the tone for that offense. How do you account for a player like that? Yeah, I think I think we just got to keep everything in front of us. Um, you know, the one thing I have noticed, uh, he's a very talented quarterback. He does a great job. Um, but I think there's some opportunities when he does make a bad decision and wants to put the ball um, in jeopardy, you know, throwing into crowds, uh, throwing across the middle with with bodies, um, you know, throwing a hitch late. We got to take advantage of those opportunities when we get them and and and, and come up with the ball on defense. We we're very limited um, in our interceptions on defense as well this year, which is 
new for us as well. But I know that we have a very talented group back there um, who can make those plays. And, you know, I'm just, you know, we're, we're working hard to make sure that we're giving them the best chance to make those plays. We're doing that, um, you know, by practice and showing them pictures and watching a ton of film and, um, you know, continuing to hone that scouting report and give our guys the keys of the car. But, um, yeah, we again, we don't need to help Drew now. She's a very good quarterback, and they do a great job protecting him as well. Um, but when he does make his his mistakes, um, as all quarterbacks do, we got to step up and make a play. What do you need to see, and what have you kind of said to to that defensive backfield to Nick to Doodles to uh, Levinsky, a unit that's that's played really well at times this year. They've had some other games mm -hmm. where. Uh, maybe they didn't make the plays they wanted to, but what's kind of your challenge been to that unit for this game? Just don't ride the roller coaster. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer that it's human nature to ride the roller coaster that uh, we tend to get really high with the highs and low with the lows. Um, you know, there's, there's this concept of um, kind of when we hit rock bottom and things go bad and we get to that failure line, we'll fight like hell to get back above the survival line. And then all of a sudden we're having success. And typically, you know, human nature is when we find success, we stop doing the things that got us there and we fall below survival. We hit failure again and then we start to come back up. And, you know, the good thing is that I told the guys on Tuesday and this is really uh, it's really, I think, pertains heavily to our DB group is um, you already know how to be an outrageous success. You guys know what it's going to take. Just do the things, do all the things that you've done to get yourself you know, to the point where you're at, where you have success. And, um, you know, win winning's not easy. Winning's not easy, but it becomes a whole lot easier when you're intentional about your process. And those are things that can get boring. Those things can get boring for football players, especially in week seven. Like, it can get boring, but you have to stick to the process. You have to stick to the recipe. You know, it's, it's practice, it's sleep, going to class, watching film, um, all those little things that were that are within our players' control, things that we necessarily can't do for them, those are the things that are going to contribute to winning. And we just can't ride the roller coaster and keep falling below survival and then reminding ourselves, oh, yeah, I didn't do this well. I'm going to go back and do that this next week. You know, at this point, um, you know, that I don't want to be talking about next week. You know, we'll talk about next week when it's next week. We have to, we have to kill it this week. We got to crush it Monday through Friday this week. Well, Josh, I appreciate you joining the program. It's always good to talk with you. Uh, better luck in noon ball next week. Yeah, you know, I think I think I went two and two today. But it doesn't matter if you win the first one. It's all about who wins the last one, man. <laughs> well, I appreciate you having, having you on. Uh, for Josh Bresky, I'm Alex Dodd. This is the Black Hill State Football Show, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Alex.